Hello, everyone, and thank you all online around the world and in person here in the Bergston Conference Center of the Peterson Institute for being with us for Rethinking Economic Policy, Steering Structural Change, our joint conference with the IMF. And one of the fringe benefits of working with the IMF, not just because they're great, um, but that means we have the right to call on some distinguished IMF speakers. And so right now, assuming she will appear, um, we have uh, the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Professor Gita Gopinath. Okay, I thought, I thought Angus Deaton had the best entrance, but now Gita just beat him. Um, for those of you who've been in the room, it's a joke. One second, let me, I, I, I was just, they were applauding your name, not yet your bio. Um, now, uh, joking aside, um, Gita is a pathbreaker intellectually and in many other ways, as we all know. Um, she comes to the job and to her public service from an incredible uh, grounding and productive background as a leading economist in international finance and macroeconomics. She's, along with a few others of her generation and her cadre, including Pierre Olivier Garinchas, her close colleague, um, set the intellectual agenda on international monetary issues for several years. And uh, she's moved from the intellectual agenda to the global agenda. Um, she has been the first deputy managing director, I should have it here, for I believe three years now, or in the third year. Um, as the FDMD, she oversees the work of staff, represents the fund at all the multilateral forums, and there's a lot of them, uh, leads the fund's work on surveillance and oversees research and flagship publications. Uh, prior to that, she did serve as chief economist of the fund as does Pierre Olivier now, as did Maury and Olivier and other friends. Um, it's a little bit incestuous, but in a good way. Um, but uh, joking aside, she played critical roles creatively working within the institutions and the international framework on the, during the pandemic um, on dealing with vaccines, on dealing with climate, um, and so in her time since leaving Harvard, when she, where she was the John Swanstra Professor of International Studies and Economics, she has made a phenomenal impact. Um, we're grateful in particular today to have Professor Gopinath with us because she has been a vocal uh, advocate and uh, light on the issue of international fragmentation, along with her colleagues at the fund. And as was stated earlier today in the first panel presentation by Gordon Brown, breakdowns in international cooperation, breakdowns in unipolarity, and obviously others in this room have spoken about this, are changing our ability to respond to structural change and are changing what are the challenges that come from structural change. And so with that in mind, we're very fortunate to have Gita Gopinath, please. Um, yes, okay. Sorry to delay your entrance. Um, so, so look, um, we've been hearing, and in particular on the last panel that Mary Lovely chaired, about issues of the future of globalization. I call it corrosion, others call it deglobalization, globalization. but you've been out there um, talking about why this matters. So can you say a bit more about the view of the fund on what fragmentation, international fragmentation means and how concerned are you about a retreat or a potential retreat from globalization? Thank you and real pleasure to be here. I, I'm following a panel that I know several speakers have already spoken to this topic and Paul I think has, uh, shares a lot of the views that, that I have here. So, you know, if I look at uh, global economic ties and economic relations, those are changing and fraying in ways that I don't think we've seen since the end of the Cold War. Uh, so if you look, um, you know, the idea that we are in a 
you know, the sense that we should have a rules-based trading system and the policies you put in place should be WTO compliant. I think there are fewer and fewer countries that seem to uh, have that as a guardrail. Uh, and we're in this environment where the kinds of policies that are being used, for instance, are you know, using subsidies, national security concerns. Uh, and both of those are areas it w for which the WTO is, is, not, is ill equipped to, uh, to deal with. And these are things, these are issues that we've been grappling with, but this is the new form of uh, uh, fragmentation that we're seeing. So, again, and I, I know that Paul said this already, but if you looked at global trade as a you know, ratio of global trade to GDP, you're not going to look at it and say, well, anything looks different. That's, that's not there. You, it looks pretty flat, hovers between 41 and 48% of GDP. But if you look under the surface, you absolutely see changing uh, connections across countries and who's trading with whom and who's the bigger trading partner. So we've done this analysis where we look at uh, blocks that are uh, blocks of countries that are more politically aligned versus not. So you can think of a US and a Europe plus block, and you can think of a China and a Russia plus block, and then you can think of a hypothetical non-aligned block. Uh, and what we are seeing uh, is that, oh, over the last couple of years, and this is really, you can pinpoint it to post Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's not there in the data before that, but you see it after that, that um, compared to what the typical determinants of trade you would look at, a standard gravity model, and you would say these predict, these are the kinds of uh, trade relations you think it should have. You, what we're seeing is in terms of global trade, trade between the blocks is about 12% lower than trade within blocks. And if you look at FDI, and this is now FDI announced projects, that number is 20% uh, lower for across as compared to within. Now, what is different this time around as compared to the Cold War is the non-aligned block is much stronger. It is a, uh, the countries are heft, have greater heft on the global market. They are a bigger part of global supply chains. And so they've been playing this uh, connector role uh, that Laura also has uh, spoken about in terms of uh, the interconnectedness uh, in where trade is going. So we see uh, these countries playing connector roles, which means that, you know, uh, for instance, a lot of the goods from China go through Vietnam or go through uh, Mexico. Uh, into the US, you're seeing FDI uh, also basically, you know, where, where, wherever it is that the US is kind of pulling back its direct trade links from, you can, you get, you're seeing foreign direct investment by those countries in, you know, kind of friendlier countries. And so those, those links uh, are there. Now, I think the big question is whether all of that is, just, is kept in the sense of, uh, you know, because we have these connected countries, ultimately we don't really see any big heavy costs of fragmentation, and so we let that be. Or uh, countries actually say, well, no, then you have the second round of where we, it's not just that we can't get it directly from a particular country, but we cannot have it sourced indirectly from another country too. And I think we are beginning to see policies that are moving in that direction, and that can be uh, very costly. Yeah. Um, just before we move on, Ngozi Okanyo Iweala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, spoke here this morning, and she was mentioning how studies done at the IMF and a study done a few years ago at the WTO came out to similar orders of magnitude about the, the GDP costs. Um, but obviously, you're talking about potentially much larger costs as things unfold. Um, so given that, um, the purpose of our conference is to think about how we should deal with some of the big structural transformations our societies are facing. So the, how does fragmentation play into this? Does it make it easier, harder, no difference? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, so there are multiple uh, transformations that are taking place. Let me uh, take one, which is on climate. There is, um, so there are a couple of points I'd make over there, which is one is if you look at 
the geographical distribution of critical min minerals that are essential for the climate transition, they're, they're concentrated you know, in yeah. different parts of the are quite concentrated. Uh, and so you know, usually you would rely on the country that has the comparative advantage and it has those resources in being able to, uh, to, uh, to get your inputs from. And it's hard to find substitutes for that because it's, it's hard to come up with substitutes, right? So that has the risk of uh, slowing the, uh, the, the transition uh, in kinds of the kinds of uh, innovations that can happen, the kinds of, you know, even in terms of just green forms of transportation, uh, it, it can slow that down. Second, um, if you are an investor and you're looking to invest you know, in, a, in a green plant that produces certain, certain uh, you know, say greener forms of, uh, of transportation, y you are now facing a market that's much more limited. But if you're going to be more fragmented, it's a smaller market that you have, and therefore the incentive to enter that market is weaker. I think there is this, uh, there is a bit of a, a fundamental uh, you know, tension between what's happening on tr in trade and what's happening in climate, which is that on, you know, on the one hand, we can all agree that climate uh, is an area with clearly with externalities, and therefore there is a role for subsidies, and subsidies have a role to play, right? And so we're seeing many countries adopt that and put that in place. Uh, but then on the other hand, like I said at the start, we don't have a trading system that knows how to deal well with subsidies. And so now, as you can see, we've run into this tension in terms of electric vehicles on the market. And how do we deal with that? Uh, now, ideally, uh, you know, countries would get together and figure out when are subsidies OK and when is it excessive and how do we pin this down? But that's not where we are, at least the hope is we could maybe get there, but that's not where we are. That's not where we are yet. Um, you started with climate change, but Obviously, another structural transformation we've been talking about, everybody's talking about, is generative AI and uh, associated technologies. Um, the research department at the fund came out with a paper, I think, in January, talking about which countries are good, or what attributes of countries are more likely to make for a successful transformation. I, could you say a few words about how you see that structural transformation going and just in general terms, any sort of parallels between the climate shift and the AI shift, or are they completely different animals? So in the case of AI, yes, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I guess a bit, there is a lot of optimism around AI, but I think we also have to be, remind ourselves that there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And it's far from clear where the, all of this is going to be transfer, transformative and generate the productivity gains that we uh, you know, think that it could do. Uh, we have this work that looks at the impact on labor markets and says right. that you, know, we ha you could have about 40% of uh, workers who are exposed to AI. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. You know, there could be a chunk that's complementary, and that's like 50% of that. And the remaining 50% in our estimate are the ones who are going to not necessarily lose their jobs because of it, but they have less value added, they have, uh, uh, you know, that they, that the wages that they might get may, may grow by less, so kind of negatively impacted by it. So this is something that we, uh, we, we are looking at. It will also very, con very concentrated. Most of the AI development is happening in only a couple of countries. In the US is where, a ton of the foundation models are, are being done. China uh, is another country where this is happening, but most other places that's not the case, right? So, so usually in, this, in, in a world where you could trade and you don't have to uh, necessarily produce everything at home, you can rely on having those linkages. Uh, but that, with, if you have fragmentation, clearly that gets complicated. One very simple area is in terms of uh, chips that are required for AI, that again, super concentrated. If you're going to have restrictions on who sells to whom, you can end up with uh, you know, development that's again, concentrated in some places and not in others and, and the problems associated with that. A third part, and we have to get our head around, is if AI becomes, you know, enters every product, including our household products, 
then everything becomes a national security concern. Right. And we then have uh, that interaction with you know, genuine concerns of national security, but then where do you draw the, the, the boundaries and where do you say it's, it's okay? And then the last point I just want to make where, um, you know, as economists, for us, trade and techno technological developments have a lot of parallels. Right. Right. So both of them are, have the virtue of raising productivity. Both have the, have the risk of affecting different segments of the labor market differently. There are winners and there are losers. Uh, and now when you think of AI, uh, AI has the potential to have national security risks just as relying on a particular trading partner has in terms of national security risk. But in terms of policies, they're getting treated very differently, right? right? So when we think about, uh, for example, the, the, the effect on jobs uh, because of uh, allowing trade and open trade, I think most economists will say that in terms of lost jobs in manufacturing in the US, automation has played a much bigger role than trade has in terms of lost break. Um, but when we come to the policy front, I think, and it comes to AI, we want there's every effort being made to keep the promise of AI and not and make sure that you don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. But when it comes to trade, the it is the, the the principles are very different. The baby is flying as we speak. Um, somebody catch it, please. Um, attempted lightheartedness aside, you're you're raising very fundamental issues that affect particularly people in the developing world, but people throughout the world. Um, you recently wrote, I think, in Foreign Policy magazine about some of the things that countries, particularly smaller open economies, can do to cope with the kinds of fragmentation we're seeing. Could you maybe recap uh, your argument and a little bit about what's the reaction been to that argument and how you think it goes yeah. now? So, so yeah, I think that uh, we're all have now become very good at identifying the problem. Uh, the harder part is how to get the solution, right? Now, first, um, I think we all agree that we need safeguards, countries need safeguards for their resilience. Uh, economic and national security are clearly very important. And being entirely efficiency driven has come at a price for, for countries uh, during the pandemic and especially after Russia's invasion. So you know, without a doubt, there is a need to build resilience and, uh, and countries should do that. And the question is how do you do all of that without uh, ending up with some you know, deep fragmentation and deep uh, decoupling in the world. So ideally, I mean, let's start with the ideal. The ideal would be if we all embraced, again, went back and embraced the rules-based trading system. Uh, we have a, people, everybody, countries work to strengthen the WTO, you know, get clearer rules of engagement when it comes to subsidies, when it comes to national security issues. Uh, fix the dispute uh, resolution mechanism that's broken at this point. All of that would be, would be very helpful, but we're not there at this point. That's not where the conversation is. I think, so there's the whole pragmatic approach. I think that's, the, that's where everybody is, is, thinks that there's a solution. Um, and the fact that countries are so interlinked at this point is the reason why everybody says, okay, well, we have to be careful because we are so Intellect. So from a pure self-preservation uh, uh, perspective, I think countries do believe in the need to have some guardrails. So practically, what does that mean? I think one is the, the diplomatic engagement is absolutely critical because this, again, is a trust-building exercise and this is going to help. So you know, China and the US working together, the working groups that they have created, I think are all very helpful. Uh, that plays a role. You know, institutions like the IMF uh, and the WTO are working together to bring transparency to you know how many subsidies are being put, what exactly are the mag what is the magnitude of the problem, what are the consequences of this, what kinds of uh, uh, implications that has, what spillovers do that have, and so on. So that hopefully will uh, also put some kind of guardrails. The second is. You know, countries coming together on to work on 
aspects of trade that they at least seem to agree on, and services trade is one of those. Uh, we have recently, through the WTO, about 90 countries that have come together to find ways to reduce the cost of services trade. So that's, again, finding common areas that you can still make progress on uh, is very helpful. You know, we need to push again on, in areas exactly where there's kind of at least a common, uh, uh, common view. So it, when it comes to food security, when it comes to health security, again, I'm, you see some desire for countries to come together and, and uh, make sure that you don't end up with big food insecurity around the world. The, ideally, we could have something climate related. We should have a green corridor where you could ensure that at least when it comes to critical minerals, green related, that they, they move. But you know, less, less uh, seems less successful on that front. And lastly, I think uh, you know, countries, when they unilaterally move in terms of uh, industrial policies, you know, more effort that can be made to make sure it's a well-identified market failure through the cost-benefit analysis, including the spillovers. And the reason I would say including the spillovers is because <coughs> what, something we've seen is, is retaliation, which is what we expect, right? So when we look at any time the US, China, or the, or the EU puts a subsidy, announces a subsidy, 12 months later, there's like a 75% probability that you get a, a retaliatory subsidy. So, you know, again, even if you're not concerned about spillovers to the rest of the world, it comes back to you. So that's, again, another area where having, you know, nobody's saying that industrial policies are all bad. There, is, there are areas where it, it can contribute, but make sure it's, it's targeted, make sure that it's temporary, it has an expiry date on it, make sure it's, you know, that it's not subject to state capture. Uh, all of that uh, is good, not just for the country itself, but also for the world. Thank you for that. Um, I wholeheartedly agree, um, which is unimportant. What, what I, but anyway, um, what, what I think is important, and where we'll close, because I know you have other commitments, um, Gita, is how does this international fragmentation affect your and your colleagues at the fund's ability to do the, your job? I mean, as you are moving forward, dealing with global finance, dealing with financial crises, dealing with long-term issues, does the kind of fragmentation and, frankly, the geopolitical issues we're now facing, it obviously affects you, but <laughs> how, how, how do you think about that? How can the fund best adapt? I think all of this just makes our job even uh, more important, if I may say so. Uh, institutions like the uh, IMF and the World Bank are, uh, you know, are remain places where we have 190 member countries that come together, and as we're doing this week, uh, to engage on economic issues. And I have to say that despite all the uh, tension, the political tensions that there are around the world for all of these members, uh, you know, at the IMF, there is a lot that gets done. I think so, so I, you know, I was more worried about what would happen in terms of uh, what the implications could be of all of these uh, uh, political tensions. I think I've been happy that, uh, you know, the membership is able to put somewhat of a multilateral hat on, at least, in terms of engaging on, on, uh, on big issues. So that, I think that's uh, important. We also see ourselves as playing a very important role in supporting integration, in making sure that you don't have uh, you know, bad forms of uh, fragmentation. And so we do a lot of work on that front in, through our surveillance when we are just looking at, again, all this research that uh, we do that Pierre Olivier oversees in, in the research department, but also the other departments, just looking very closely at what's happening in terms of the patterns of trade, the trade restrictions, the subsidies, uh, what the consequences can be. And also when we are now engaging with uh, countries and we do our annual Article 4s with each of the countries, 
we now find ourselves engaging more on industrial policies because that's become uh, an area of economic importance for many of these countries. And so our advice in terms of how to you know, evaluate the trade-offs and hopefully do it somewhat right uh, is, is another way that we, we work together. And of course, in terms of our uh, lending, you know, we are in a world where if, you know, with, if these, this kind of fragmentation leads to greater volatility in the economy, then you know, the IMF has a role there in terms of lender of last resort to help countries tide through these times. Uh, we, I mean, we, we know that if you have segmented commodity markets, you know, we could have much more severe food crises. Uh, during the, it, this was not fragmentation related, but uh, during the, uh, the, the, in 2022, when food prices shot up, uh, we opened a, a food shock window to help countries that were severely exposed to this big spike in, in food prices. So we try to move it quickly. Um, um, but I think our, our number one goal is to reinforce the importance and the value of multilateralism. Thank you. With that, uh, please join me in thanking the first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, Peter Bopanak. Thank you. Um, that concludes the first day of our program of our conference on rethinking economic policy steering structural change. For our global audience online, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time if you want to watch live. Of course, this will all be posted with transcripts and references and slides and papers and so on on the PIE and IMF websites for your convenience. For those of you who are participants here live and in person, it's my pleasure uh, to invite you to partake of the IMF and Peterson Institute hospitality and the good weather and uh, join us for a uh, reception and light supper. Thank you very much.